Hello, Trash Future listeners. Before we start the free one, I wanted to take a moment to shout out the Strike Fund for Charity Workers at St. Mungo's, an anti-homelessness charity where workers have experienced a real-terms pay cut of over 25% in the past decade. They've been on strike for three months, and if you want to support them, there's a crowdfunding link in the show notes. Thanks for being a listener, and please enjoy this week's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this free episode. It's the free one. It's the free one. Thank you, Milo, for your able mm. assistance there. Uh, oh, I, yeah. I don't get anything from that. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, sorry. It's I'm, um, the bloody free one. Uh, uh, yeah, he is still up in Scotland. Uh, and mm-hmm. I have taken my cue as to who I'm thanking for the free one from the World Chess Federation, if you'll excuse me. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Is it Bobby um, Fisher? <laughs> it's it's not in the notes, but I think I just I just want to ask, like, on what basis would someone's chromosomes give them an advantage in chess? Oh well, so if you're not familiar with the, this piece of news, on background, uh, the FIDE, the the World Federation of Chess, has uh, banned trans women from the women's categories in chess. Why is there a women's category? Oh, well, I can answer that one first. The reason why there's a women's category in chess is because male chess masters are all the most unbelievable dangers to women. Um, oh, okay. Like, it's up there with the pure mathematics in terms of places where you can sort of, like, sustain yourself while not knowing anything about how to interact with anyone, but especially women. Um, oh, okay. And so, yeah, it, it was, like, very unpleasant and you know hazardous to women to be in chess competitions with male chess players because male chess players are frequently the worst they invented uh female categories which trans women are now banned from so normal uh yeah yeah because uh, boys are clever and girls are you know pretty yeah. or whatever yeah you have to, to to move the rook uh you actually have to use a um a blending brush, apparently. Mm, yeah, it's very weird I mean, they made that the motto of the World Chess Federation. <laughs> yeah, anyway. I, I'm I'm forced now to sort of like um, only play in the women's bracket of the Netflix Queen's Gambit official board game rather than chess. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're gonna have Absolutely. to go into the um the, the women's only bracket of uh, competitive StarCraft two. I mean, it feels that way. It's it's a very surreal sensation to find yourself like, okay, I was never going to take up like professional cycling at an international level, right? So being banned from that, that didn't, you know, obviously it was bad and it felt bad, but it didn't really sort of like hamper me in that way. Yeah, this is going to affect way more trans women. <laughs> what? Chess yeah, was, is a trans women ass activity. I was going to say, yeah, but uh, no, it's not that I was going to like take up chess again exactly. It's more that like now it's reaching into stuff that is not even a sport. And it just sort of like stuff that I wasn't even beginning to take seriously. Like it's 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 a surreal experience to find that you can't like you know oh your your future athletic career is gone fine whatever. Uh, but like to find out that like ah oh, now you can never make it in the big leagues of Connect Four. That's really surreal. Yeah, it's it's almost like say well okay well we've we we've had we've we're now saying pub quiz we're segregating it mm-hmm. by gender. And we're being really finicky about who goes where. It's bizarre. <laughs> yeah, I was I was doing like pub quiz doping, you know. Yeah, what well, was that? Just where you have your phone? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. it's it's like you do all of the same stuff as like cycling doping, where you have the like legions of doctors. You're getting injected with stuff that's yeah, being made yeah. in a lab at like a sort of like you're governmental level. You're threatening all the whistleblowers. Yeah, exactly. In order to remember, you know, the mm. date that the French Revolution started for one point. Yeah, in, in, yeah, yeah. It's where basically you go to the top of K2 and you get a guy to ask you a bunch of uh, pub quiz questions, which is obviously harder because of the oxygen deprivation. And then you have some blood taken out of you. And then right before 
before the pub quiz, you have that blood injected back into you, yeah. and then it makes you better at pub quiz. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. All right, all right. Yeah. I, and also some estradiol for good measure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to go into our uh, our actual yeah. sort of planned content we have for today. Um, <laughs> now for the synthesizer round, uh, the trans <laughs> women are going to be asked to leave the room for this bit. <laughs> um, so we've. I, I wanted to share some updates on two old, like two probably of our best friends. On this show, hmm. not Matt oh, Hancock, Patrick Wyman. Other yeah, no best topics. <laughs> Patrick, oh, we don't okay. discuss the comings and goings of Patrick Wyman. At least not of the episodes <laughs> that I'm on. <laughs> like just doing a sort of like fan episode that's largely about Patrick. It's it's sort of like very uncomfortable to listen to. Yeah, a pa- an episode about Patrick would certainly be very large. Yeah. Mm, he did arms today. No, I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about um, the podcast that goes directly to Riley Reid and the podcast that stalks Patrick. White. Patrick, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry, uh, but I want to talk about <laughs> Jan Marsalek. That's right. Oh, that's Here a guy we is. love too. Yeah, yeah. former okay. barrel inhabitant Jan Marsalek <laughs> no. is back. International man of yeah. mystery. Yeah, P- probable neighbor of Gerard Depardieu, Ma- Jan Marsalek. <laughs> Yeah, international <laughs> cylinder inhabitant, Jan Marsalek. <laughs> so, the very much alive Jan Marsalek has popped up again. <laughs> Which is a great way to have someone start. <laughs> a man who is aspirating uh, yeah. <laughs> has oh, uh, popped up again. And this was sort of shared to me by, um, by uh, some listeners to the show. A-, a few people have tweeted this at us. Um, Oh yeah, we're, this is one of those we're monitoring the situation yeah. things. Oh yeah, yeah. Looking into it very strongly. Yeah. So I was looking mm-hmm. into it very strongly, and I mean, there, it's a bit of a longer story about again, like uh, uh, espionage, Russian secret intelligence, and so on. Yeah, they here, they, they, they arrested some Bulgarians uh, yeah. on, on suspicion of being Russian Russian spies, which is fun. And and this one. Uh, one guy, Orlin Rusev, uh, has been confirmed as the owner of a signals interception company that provided surveillance equipment to Jan Marsalek. See, there's a couple of things going on here, but the main one that I'm thinking about is buying your own spy equipment. Seldom a feature of the James Bond movies. You never really had to see Bond in Q's lab, like, fiddling with, to, you know, like, get his card out, you know? Well, this would be austerity Bond. Like, Bond now oh, has, yeah. you know, the school teachers are buying pencils and James Bond is buying his own Rolex. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, this is, uh, Rusev provided Marsalek with basically equipment capable, I'm sort of glossing here, of calculating locations and connections of other phone subscribers. So it's a, you want to snoop on someone else and avoid being snooped on yourself. Oh, that's that's very boring. Like, you know, there's no, like, concealed explosives, you know, it doesn't fire a laser. It's just like, oh, we've made you a phone that's slightly better at being a phone. That's, the, that's one of the main... The, there are a billion sub-themes to the entire Wirecard story, but one of the ongoing ones about Jan Marsalek is just... How lame so much international espionage actually is in day to day on a day to day basis. I, I'm being very reductive about signals intelligence and like cybersecurity and stuff uh, because I think it's funny, but because like there's this multi billion, if not trillion dollar like ecosystem incorporating huge swaths of like intelligence services and criminal organizations and and state actors and non-state actors and then you you look at what it all involves and yeah it's you know all of the fun exotic espionage stuff but the operational sense of it is guys texting each other a thing i've never cared about the trouble is now now that all of these trans women can no longer play chess they are more focused on intercepting our communications at gender confirmation headquarters <laughs> sorry i would really really like a like a shirt or a mug or i don't know like a mouse pad or something with the gchq logo with gender confirmation headquarters there we on go it. now now it's merch baby right. let's get a go. bunch of get a bunch of orders to like forwarding addresses that just go to cheltenham <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is the new windbreaker. You've got the obvious fraud <laughs> office windbreaker, and then you've got gender confirmation headquarters yeah. windbreaker. Yeah, we, d- we just do them both at once, and you get a, a like a discount if you buy them both at once. That's the deep state pack, you know? <laughs> so, it says, Rusev forwarded a message to Marcelek from a representative of Uphone Mobile, a Chinese company. Also, it's, it's about, it's the espionage itself is guys texting each other, and most of the things that people intercept are people being like, hey, you should look at this. Hey, check this yeah, out. I, I, so, the thing is, right, 
I've recently increased my dosage of estrogen, and as such, it's really like feminizing me in some interesting ways, such as my opinion on The Sopranos, Breaking Bad, uh, any show like this is, man, it's a lot of guys just talking to each other in rooms. And that's kind of how I feel about this now, too. It's like, oh, it's just, it's just boys texting each other. I don't care. Shut yeah. up. <laughs> They're in the back of the pork store. They're talking about Wirecard. Yeah. So <laughs> pretty They're much, shaving yeah. the pig. Uh, so it's. I mean, they're, like yeah. they're, they're in the back room of a Bulgarian surveillance equipment company in Hounslow. <laughs> it's, it, it's like okay, Bulgarian Why? surveillance equipment feels like it's a bit in the category of like Glasgow Kiss, where like <laughs> Bulgarian surveillance equipment would just be like a huge magnifying glass that you like comically follow a guy around with. <laughs> so, Rusev mentioned the company offered top-notch personalized solutions and had placed a, a, well, a, an order for a quote. Yorgi Markov, Yorgi yeah, Markov, the guy who got like uh, got with the ricin umbrella, that was the Bulgarians mm. too, I seem to recall. So maybe, what what if the Bulgarians just have like one trick and it's everything is umbrella mounted and the Bulgarian surveillance mm. equipment is like a big pair of headphones hooked into the like handle of a long umbrella. Mm. Oh no! And then, and then the listening device is the umbrella goes reverse, and it looks like it's blown up with the wind, and then you just point it at where you want to listen. Parabolic. Ah, Perfect. clever, clever. Um, yeah. It says, and they already placed an order for a quote exceptionally durable phone with exotic features. And and, okay. and gave Marcel like a quote features. exotic device, but it's just a Samsung push button phone with anti surveillance phone firmware that could track other mm, mobile phone listen users. Listen closely, 007. If you press this button here and here, large quantity of explosives will detonate in this Samsung Galaxy Tab. <laughs> Thank you. I noticed that there was Bulgarians on the plane, but it was just someone trying to charge their Samsung Galaxy yeah. S7. But also, it's like, I, I want Jan Marcelek to have been, like, given the physics from Just Cause. Like, I, I don't want him to just have, like, a phone <laughs> well, that's he, extra good. Yeah, but also, he still would have had to buy it himself. Yeah, but he can! So it's like... Yeah, no, fully, but like going to work, like I, I have purchased infinite parachutes. Uh, it's like, come on, because the, the the other thing is, he's he's not a spy. No, at least not in that sense. He's yeah. not like employed by the Russian government like the Bulgarian guy is. He's mm. just like he's an agent. He's an asset. And he's buying his own shit? That's embarrassing. I had to buy this very expensive phone because of my lifestyle. You see, it's very hard to get signal inside of an oil drum. It's like a Faraday <laughs> cage. <laughs> well, the, <coughs> the, thing is, the Faraday barrel. What reminds yeah. me, yeah. what Jan Marsalek reminds me of, because if you look back in the Jan Marsalek story, it's a guy who is clearly mm. ridiculously excited to be, have been contacted by Russian intelligence. Right. This is yeah. true. this is a guy with the best. Finally, little old me. <laughs> yeah, like the best day of his life is where he got to feel like a spy, and like he went to mm. Libya with all the mm. Gucci gear that would just get him shot immediately, uh, or no, Syria with all the yeah, Gucci same. gear. Um, he bragged about having the recipe for Novichok to impress. So he didn't want to be a spy. He wanted to have been a spy. Yeah, it's it's not a Nigella, is it? That one. Like the ingredients <laughs> are quite hard to come by. Deliciously sinful Novichok. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, who you've got a good us? Asian grocer near you, it's worth a visit to get the right stuff for Novichok. Like <laughs> some people try and approximate it with cayenne pepper, but it's really worth getting the real gear. Yeah, if you can't find sort of like cholinergic compounds, store bought is fine. Um, yeah. but, but like, whomst among us, we would all be like this. Maybe not with the Russians necessarily, but if someone was like, you know, made you an offer to go be a super spy and you're, you know, you would 100% take that offer purely to be like, no, it was crazy. They gave me, you know, special devices. They gave me the cool watch. But, but, but then they don't give you the cool watch. It turns out, no, exactly. My point, you, you'll be disappointed because it turns out you just have, like, a phone. Yeah. You know, it, it has an app on it that, you know, lets you, like, spy on men slightly mm -hmm. more interestingly. It's like... Yeah, boo! Mm. Boo espionage. Uh, I have another... Actually, actually, Everyone at cheated. Sailor's Gay Sauna has this app. Yeah. <laughs> it's not secret at all. Yeah, it's got exotic features. It has Grinder installed on it. <laughs> this is like the plot of an episode of Archer. You're going to need to find him on Grinder. It's called Tradecraft Genius. I blend. I, I had another quick uh, uh, news hit for us up at the front. 
um, before mm. we do the startup and then get into the main content, which is another best friend of ours. Lex Greensill is back in the news. One Australian oh, man. Hell Let's go. Yeah. I mean, we really are checking in on our blokes today. These are like some mm. of our favorite. If Matt, I mean, Matt Hancock released a funny TikTok, but we'll have to talk about that another time. Um, mm. Yeah. Because these, if it's Marcelec, it's Greensill, it's the classics. <laughs> I have a phone with some exotic features that has this app called Matt Hancock MP it tra- installed on it. It tracks all of the thoughts of one British MP. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, morning Zoo sound effects. We got Lex on deck. It's time to flex the Lex. Uh, so, <laughs> what's the Lex report? So, uh, as the, the ongoing series of losses, suits and insurance finagling over of the collapse of green sill is going to be going on probably for most of our lifetimes not finagling yeah mm. and uh, a new piece of information this is part of a dispute that if you remember what happened with green sill what caused it to collapse is that tokyo marine an insurance company bought mm. their credit insurer and said to the one guy who just authorized way too much credit insurance for all their risky shit hey what was this and then he immediately quit um this, and <laughs> T- just, tokyo marine is a movie that john cena will be in eventually it was, I, and you know what i'll watch it but yeah uh anyway so tokyo marine now having taking on this insurance company now is responsible for quite a bit of like those insurance claims now has to like try and avoid paying as many of them as possible and this is from the ft it was brought to us of course by uh, brought to my attention by Robert Smith. Um, uh, Greensill- they call him the K. Wiggins of the London office. <laughs> Greensill Capital <laughs> charged an unreasonable and excessive fee for arranging financing for NHS building projects and then deliberately dis- avoided disclosing this fax. Now, getting into the actual huh. nitty gritty of what this was is has a kind of funny conclusion. Um, So the reason that the um, insurance company would argue this is if it was unreasonable and wasn't like supported, if it had no business justification, then they could say, well, we're not paying out the claim because this was clearly fraudulent. Um, Mm. So basically, they're arguing that Greensill is responsible for uh, misrepresentations and non-disclosures in relation to financing for CatFoss, a company engaged in building a bunch of NHS hospitals throughout um, Derby, Dorset and Essex, Milo's beloved Essex. And, oy, oy, be lucky. and <laughs> here's yeah. the first thing that I thought was incredible. But it wasn't so lucky for them. For Adam Curtis voice. For fifteen point three a fifteen point three million pound lending facility, Catfoss paid Greensill a ten point four million pound fee. Oh, awesome. I mean, th- you don't need that money to build the hospital as the main thing. Well, um, well, Alice, it's funny you say that because you literally don't. Mm. That Greensill, in one case, was continuing to advance funds and get those funds insured, like those advances insured, even though that particular NHS trust had been completed years previously, in January 2019, well before huh. the collapse. Wait, so they, they were billing to build a built hospital? That's, well, they were billing to finance the construction of a built hospital, yes. That sounds so legal. I, do, I don't... Look, I'm not a, 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 a legalist, but I don't no. think it is. Maybe I'll defer to I, the lawyers. I, listen, I, I think I think that maybe this is as you know, someone who's having some legal troubles of his own. Uh, President Trump once said, "I think this is very legal and very cool." Um, it clearly like raises no questions <laughs> to just be. So, uh, everything in this country is scams, and I uh, next uh, next week or so um, when when you're on sabbatical I, and you know I'm left to do an episode, I plan to talk about some scams uh, and the sort of scam based economy. And this is just like you know another one on the pile. It's not even a particularly egregious example. It strikes me. Mm. Well, it's like it's like it's the I think this wouldn't even be egregious and this like you know shows how the state that we're in i think that this is just sort of work a day just like yeah, yeah defrauding the health system or whether by sort of um hugely overcharging a fee that's two-thirds of the of the um the structuring fee that's two-thirds of the value of the loan or um just like continuing to structure finance and take fees for a construction process that's already been completed um that's so small potatoes but just the fact that Every time I think about something to do with Greensill, I think about the fact that the guy who was the main sort of hope of one of the parties to retain, the two major parties to retain relevance, like David Cameron, was so embroiled in this and just nothing happened. 
the heart of the machine. Mm. Yeah, I, I will say this: this is only a seventh of a Captain Tom in terms of like the yeah. uh, amount of money it's take. It's like you know affecting on the NHS. So, but it's the um the pure sort of yeah normalization at the highest levels of just sheer sheer simple graft. It, that's one mm. thing, but the demand that you don't look at it is the galling thing. The fact that ever since we talked about Greensill, I checked every week for if anyone had written anything about it outside the niche financial press. And the fact is, it was just time after time. There was It was just a, a that puff piece in BBC Lancashire about how he flew a woman to Germany for experimental cancer treatment on his private jet. While all this shit was going on, it was just mm -hmm. not, you, you couldn't see it. There was no one interested oh. in seeing it, really, outside a small group of obsessive weirdos, has, of which we were has one. the kind of, like, wealth um, density that sort of, like, bends light around it, mm -hmm. you know? You know, and it's it's it, you mentioned The Sopranos earlier, Alice. It's like, yeah, swap out a business suit for a tracksuit and a big sandwich, and this is just a scene from The Sopranos. You know, oh yeah, we're uh, what? What if an Australian man was Italian American? Yeah, what if that? Our bloody international financial scheme has been brought down by those people over at the Transfem podcast. Which <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a Transfem podcast if we have one Transfem, unless I like start like transitioning more of you. Maybe it's like... I was, um, I was basically just building on the Gender Confirmation HQ by taking the TF podcast. <laughs> uh, the anatomy of a joke. Well, maybe it's uh, mm. we could say that it's like... Um, it's like French rules for referring to gender in a group, or if there's one man in a group, oh, it's okay. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the one trans femme in your podcast makes it all sort of like mixed and applies the feminine yeah. pronoun to the podcast. Sure. So the joke yeah, yeah, works yeah. if you apply French grammar. So <laughs> so the joke works if you apply French grammar. If you apply the reverse of French grammar. Yeah, but yes. If you apply a mirror image of French, we should all go on Only Connect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we would do really well. <laughs> yeah. Um, look. Anyway, that's the the green cell update. Cat Foss, by the way, is a whole a whole other thing, right? It's um, it it sort of went out of business. Um, uh, well, uh, yeah, I it mean, became known it as Yusuf Foss for a while. <laughs> But it had such a great business model of um, not building hospitals. Mm. <laughs> I mean, we're not building yeah. hospitals all the time. I'm doing that right now. Yeah, you know, and that's to be fair, a we made pretty good money out of activity. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know? Statistically speaking, most British yeah. people, most of the time, are not building hospitals. I'm thinking that's of following my dad problem. into not building hospitals, but I just don't <laughs> want to be like another person who's just not building hospitals. <laughs> I believe they did build does. a couple hospitals, but they were... Um, I think ruined by the green cell thing. I, I looked less into Cat Foss, but mm. they, they seemed like a whole. Building some hospitals is an even more interesting area of the mm. economy. Like, I don't habitually build hospitals, <laughs> but I've built a couple. I mean, I who has it? Yeah. <laughs> a dilettante hospital builder. <laughs> I'm a sort of gifted amateur, you know? Going down to the shed in the bottom of the garden to build a little hospital. Yeah, yeah. Guy who looks like George R. R. Martin, whose thing is building hospitals in his spare time. Yeah, you remember when your dad used to like have to move an entire MRI machine and like an intensive care ward into the shed to finish out his hospital in there? Uh, look, I, I don't want to go into cat fast now. It might be worth going into in more detail at a later time. But I want to ask you two about four dot screen. F four dot screen. Four dot screen. We connect people in a fragmented world. Uh, ooh, interesting. I, I mean. We've already had the literally a bunch of phones taped together thing, and that wasn't even four screens. So that was like five. So it, it it can't be that in a sort of like closer physical sense. Um, mm. What do we think? Uh, uh, how about this, but uh, Milo? Before you guess, I'm going okay. to say what their values are. This will probably clear right. it right up. I'm sure it will. Yeah. What we believe: uh -huh. think big and be bold. We have ambitious goals and take bold decisions. Two. Mm. What are those goals, you might ask? They're not stated. Well, the goal is mm. to take the driver's seat. We take ownership, strive for excellence, and apply best practices. Oh, and then okay, it's called four screen, and then it says four, the digit four, everyone. We've, oh, no. We value our Clever. diversity okay. and proactively help each other to succeed while having fun and celebrating progress. What? Also, at this point, I've, I I've should... I've been hit with a horrible, horrible hunch. Yeah. I'm I'm shrugging mm. my big detective trench coat. Okay, on. go ahead. You got your Bulgarian when, surveillance equipment with you. That's right. When you used the expression "the driver's seat," was that in the copy? Yes, yes, it was. This is 
in car something. That it is. Yes, it is in car something. It's it, it was a literal driver's. Yeah. It, it, does it like put a screen like in your steering wheel instead of in your center console? Not the steering wheel. No. How about this? Let me tell you two more things. Number one, it's a German company, and uh, it touts as it's one of its investors, Matthias Müller. Fear screen. Right, yeah. <laughs> it was uh it w- touts as one of its investors, Matthi- Matthias Muller, who was CEO of Volkswagen mm-hmm. until twenty eighteen. Yeah. Inventor oh. of the corner. <laughs> yes. Okay. I wonder yeah. what scandal could have possibly anyway. Well, I heard actually he got a lot of family obligations and needed to take more time to to spend with them. Well, he needed yeah. to go and visit his cousin who now lives in that barrel in Russia. <laughs> no. Uh for the fourth one, four wins. We succeed by adding sustainable value to all four players who are drivers, mobility partners, businesses, and ourselves. We connect. Does it 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 put ads on the outside of your car like a taxi? I'm going to just give this to Alice. You've seen the in-car screen that you use to navigate, right? Of course. It puts ads on the inside of your car. Yes, that's right. (laughs) No, what? What? No, you can't. But but you're you're trying... Like... At least in a, in a like a, a black cab, right? Where they have the ad screens. Yeah. It's like, oh, have you considered getting a black cab? And you go, clearly yes, because I am in one. Like the guy mm. driving it isn't seeing those. But if you're just in a regular normal yeah. style car, mm-hmm. then uh, and it's like hooked to the like center console thing, which is already extremely distracting. Then you you would be you you'll get an ad that's like, have you considered driving a car? For the car you're already driving and you just sort of like plow into a wall or something. Yeah, well maybe you should have considered driving. Mm. It's sort of more like a bully like, hey, consider driving yeah. a car. Nice drive, no drive. And you plow yeah. into a wall. And then you start thinking about driving a different car uh, and you crash your car into well, a wall. Uh, Alice, I want to respond to what you said with the fact that they create truly connected cars for seamless journeys and bring to life a network of businesses, drivers, and mobility partners. So you might what want to reconsider. What journeys have seams? Yeah. Um, yes. What, what is I, I, what is a seam? Is that stopping for a piss? It's sort of like any intermodal journey, I would say, is a seamed journey. Uh, if you have to like mm. get off a train to get on a tram, that's a seam. If you have to change trains, yeah. it's probably a seam. Um, but it depends. But what if by car? What if that? Some, hear me out here. What if you had to fill up your car without stopping at the Wild Bean Cafe, and you had to stop at a lesser petrol station? How about that? Oh, I thought you were going to imply some kind of in-flight refueling system for cars. Oh, no, like that they're going to drive I, I alongside just, you just, in yeah, a just tanker. Drive, yeah, drive the tanker in front of me and like spool the hose out. You know? <laughs> yeah, so, that'd be uh, sick. I hate going to the petrol station. They should bring that in. So, so mm. I'm going to tell you a bit, a bit about how it works, right? So automakers can implement the new four-screen API into their infotainment systems to provide bri- drivers with a broad variety of value-added services. Businesses, meanwhile, uh-huh. log on to the portal, set up campaigns, uh, and have real-time communication with drivers. Through our platform... I genuinely would have rather this were my original idea of its ads on the outside of the car. That would have been somehow less intrusive to me. Imagine imagine like you're on like a five-lane roundabout in like outer London and you're, and you're trying to see the navigation while navigating the roundabout and then like it's it, the screen is filled with a pop-up that says like, MILFs in your area, hungry for calm. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is like you should have subscribed to Car Premium. In order to not know that there are horny milfs in your area, yeah, that's right. I hate when it keeps changing the uh, navigation thing so that my destination is horny milfs. Mm. Oh, well, how come I keep having this API? It says that this um, this uh, excuse me, this VPN, where it says that there are Bulgarian horny milfs in my area, where I clearly said Hounslow. So they said, <laughs> through our platform, you have at your disposal data that smart or connected cars generate. This is you, the advertiser. Whether it's location, yes. brand, class, or engine type, this information is available for your awareness goals. And our strategic partnership managers are always available to recommend to you the best strategy. So basically, the screen takes all of the information that your car generates, which if you go back to any of our episodes of which Victoria is Scott, is a fuck ton. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And then turn it into something that will allow you to be more effectively targeted by ads for, I assume, petrol stations. But uh, Milo and Alice, your idea of MILFs yeah. is also compelling. Bleach, bin liners, kitchen knives. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it seems you're driving out to the woods a lot. Just the algorithm really detecting that I drive in a sort of like MILF desiring fashion. So, mm. it's a lo- it's location You're driving at low speed past an all bar one. It looks like you're cruising <laughs> for MILFs. <laughs> 
So they say, and how does it work? So it's a, they say it's a first technology platform designed to connect, interact, and engage with drivers through live content on the in-car screen. It has location-based mm-hmm. solutions, which means ads will pop up based on where you are. Um, and they increase brand visibility and customer engagement by reaching an exclusive target audience of, it is assumed, people who are driving new enough cars that the cars now have native ads. Yeah, people who want to fuck MILFs. Yeah. I mean, listen, everyone wants to fuck MILFs, but I don't want this. Uh, like, on a personal level, this makes me very uncomfortable. Well, yeah, because it's just say, hey, what, what if that thing that in order to use, you have to sort of take your attention off of the road in front of you while you barrel mm-hmm. down it in the big metal uh, you know, um, bullet. What if you looked away from it? And what if your attention was pulled away from the road intentionally? What about that? Yeah, yeah great. Then, it, then I'd be missing out on deals if I didn't do that. Yeah, well, uh, they would say that what they do is enhance the overall driving experience. Now, Milo, as a frequent driver, do you wish that your in- car navigation and infotainment screen was designed to enhance the overall driving experience and connect you, around, connect you excuse me, with the environment around you in real time? Hi, Riley. First of all, let me just say it's an honor to be asked on the podcast. Um, I, <laughs> I would say all of the time, I think um, when you're driving a car, uh, it really enhances the experience to be told uh, where local MILFs are or which garden center has a sale. Or perhaps if, if crypto wolves could enhance your experience of the Internet. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's going to be ads, but it's like all the ads that uh, on Twitter promoted ads. Yeah, now. It's yeah, going to yeah. be anabolic dwarves. Yeah, that's right. Anabolic, you're just your GPS is rerouting you to anabolic dwarves, and you're like, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh not again. I, I, I'm sitting still in traffic, but the distance to the anabolic dwarves is decreasing. Why? Yeah, yeah. You've you've got a huge dent in the front of your car, and you take it into BMW, and they're like, yeah, now nah, that looks like anabolic dwarves. Sorry, mate, that the warranty's void. Now you can't do nothing with that. Well, they're anabolic, you see. Were it a regular dwarf? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be as much of an issue, but it is it is in the owner's manual that the car is not is not resistant to anabolic dwarves. So um yeah, I mean if you if you were if this were a Japanese car, you'd probably be all right, but no. <laughs> so they say they also say in their FAQs, what value does it add for equipment manufacturers, i.e. auto manufacturers? Connected cars generate billions of data points, which auto manufacturers are unable to fully leverage, to which I would say, good. They're my data points. Mm. I would like to use them, please. Um, so, oh, oh, ye of little faith, you know, if you think that they're not able to leverage these things effectively. This means that every vehicle on the road is a business opportunity that can create added value for automakers and drivers. Uh, where car manufacturers can finally use these data points, bridging the communication gap between drivers and their surroundings. Milo, as a frequent driver, do you wish that something would bridge the <laughs> communication gap between you and your surroundings that didn't necessitate you rolling down the window and shouting? Riley, allow me to just say, uh, first of all, thank you very much for asking me on the podcast. And um, uh, yes, I, I routinely think, what if you could use the infotainment system in your car to connect to the infotainment system in another driver's car and call them a fucking wanker who should learn to drive? I actually do think this. That would be the one service that I would use. Yeah, sort of like doing like watchdog style, like car hacking. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. I, I just, I just really want to salute uh, Milo Edwards for coming on and like racking up the number of like guest appearances that we've had per episode. You know, <laughs> yeah, previously yeah, yeah. it's only been one, but now we're, we're up to two. And who I'm, knows? I'm in the Sky's lounge with Wyman now. Mm. Yeah, you guys got lampshades on your heads. Um, so it says, yeah, me and him are making a podcast about Riley. <laughs> <laughs> this offers a next level driving experience with improved navigation and relevant recommendations while monetizing the data. Finally, the driver's experience is at the real core for us. Our API is seamlessly integrated in the navigation system while our communications follow all privacy and security regulations. I love when an advertiser thinks about me. I, 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 I we, hate. We follow. Yeah, and what they say about you is we are obliged not to break the law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We follow all the privacy regulations, uh, depending on your jurisdiction. If you're in America, good luck. Well, mm-hmm. here's what it does for drivers is that because uh, I I'll, I'll give you I've been mostly talking about the FAQs of this company because it's really funny to try to watch them twist and pirouette around. We found another way to comp- to compel people to be spied on. Would you like to monetize that for your gas station? 
Uh, well, not yeah, just being yeah. spied on, but combining that with a sort of like a uh, startup that flashes a torch in the eyes of like one person in a hundred driving at any given minute. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The startup is called Laser Pen, and uh, <laughs> it's a thing that attaches to your car infotainment system, and it shines a laser pen directly into your eyes while you're going 80 miles an hour on the motorway. Yeah, but it's a it's a Morse code to subliminally get you to turn off into the services and have a Toby Carvery. Yeah, yeah. It's actually to discourage speeding. The faster you go, the more lasers it shines into your eyes. It's so <laughs> lethal. Yeah. And we can't see any problem with it. Or We're trying to combat speeding. We can't see any problem with it, or indeed anything at all. Hmm, That's sort of right. A blurry haze. Yeah, it gives you LASIK while you're driving. The drivers can easily find and interact with their favorite brands or services and, and receive customized offers from businesses along the route. Never before have drivers been able to explore the car surroundings and discover relevant content as they do now. It's got windows. You can look out of the way. You can carry a map around. You know, even on your phone, you can generally get a sense of what's. You don't need. Like, if you drive past a Taco Bell, do you need your car infotainment system to activate the uh, Taco Bell mode and screech the words Taco Bell out of every speaker at maximum volume until you pull over, like, get out of the car clutching your head and, like, fall into the Taco Bell insensible. You're outside Taco Bell. The MILFs that we're navigating you towards may be hungry for calm, but perhaps they're also hungry for a little snack from Taco Bell. So, mm. TM. So they uh, they say that they Taco Bell is a brand that believes in living milk. Well, <laughs> that's right. What are the ad, what are the ad types that they offer? They offer four solutions from which you can include choose to increase brand awareness and customer engagement. Uh, branded pins integrated onto the maps of navigation screens that automatically display your logo. We made maps slightly harder to use. Gotcha. Yeah, so you search awesome. petrol station, and then like all the shell ones are giant. Like I can't remember if I've told. Oh, oh, oh mm. you search petrol station, and the map is crowded out with Taco Bell pens. I can't remember if I've told this uh, story on the podcast before. So please do not tell me if I have. I'm not interested. Um, that I once uh, flew on. Uh, Milo and Patrick Wyman are going to get your ass on their podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I once flew uh, Etihad Airways to go to Shanghai. Mm. And uh, the there was a stopover in Abu Dhabi because Etihad is like the Emirates national airline. It's the Abu Dhabi one that's based in the capital. And on the in-flight um, information system on Etihad, there are only two cities in the UAE visible, Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Uh, Dubai uh, has just a small dot and Abu Dhabi has a big star. <laughs> It's like they put a big middle finger to Dubai specifically on the Etihad in-flight screen. Yeah, and it's going to be like this. You're going to like, ultimately, you want to go to Dubai, right? And so we haven't given you a map of anything near where you're driving. What we've given you is a map of the world that has a big star pin for Dubai in it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. You keep, you keep getting pulled onto the, the channel tunnel to start driving to Dubai. So the mm. rivalry between Abu Dhabi and Dubai is so funny. It's like a rivalry between like two members of Blue. Like, <laughs> hey, like yeah. Oh fuck off, Anthony Costa. You're not a real musician. Not like me, Duncan James. Like it's like you're Abu Dhabi and Dubai. You both suck. Get doesn't over have the it. sort of like yeah. Abu Dhabi doesn't have the rich vein of like long lasting culture and taste that Dubai has. Dubai has never had the city on lockdown. Actually, can I a brief sidebar about when I fly on Emirates, my favorite thing about Emirates is they have in-flight podcasts which play automatically when you connect your headphones to the infotainment system. And so while I'm choosing a movie or whatever, you end up just listening to the but they're all like puff pieces about Dubai where it'll be like a guy with a very BBC voice doing a very serious interview um, with a guy called like Wank Norstrop, who's been in charge of opening like Dubai's first ever Michelin star hot dog stand. And he and he's like, so why did you want to bring this really exciting project to Dubai? And he's like, well, I love Dubai because it loves the future and it loves anything that's pushing boundaries. They're not stuck in the past unless what you mean is to do with laws and women's rights. But broadly speaking, they're in the future and they want things like a hot dog with a foam. This is something you can do in Dubai and this is why people come from all over the world to taste a hot dog that really, it makes you confused. He's like, thank you so much. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not even exaggerating. Like, this is what they're like. Like, I wish you could download them because we could do a whole series where we just review the Emirates Airline podcast. Like, they're so fucking You do good. realize. We should try and get hired. We gotta we gotta try yeah. and get them to, like, uh, buy us out. Or at so. least mm. do, like, a tour to somewhere that Emirates flies. And then mm. we can just that that can be the tour. Australia, the live show content yeah. is just a review of the Emirates. Like I will spe- listen to all of the Emirates podcasts and transcribe. Okay, new Australian tour idea. TM can't do it. Copyright. Yeah, yeah. we just try and like the corporate mooch era. I've been trying to gin this up on well, there's your problem as well. Where I've been trying to bully the tourism board of San Diego into giving me a free holiday. Um, so if we can combine those two, then we're gonna get an ideal. Emirates flight Perfect. from London to San Diego. <laughs> Yeah, we can oh, check out Glamour San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I want to I want to finish this up and then get into the main stuff. Um, search ad makes your brand appear as a top search reco- result in the uh, in the in car location search list. So they basically you can use the in car search function to look for a business category they need, and then you just pay to put yourself at the top of the list. You're in the car. You search restaurant. It shows you Taco Bell. You search hospital. It shows you Taco Bell. Um, it shows you the hot dog stand in Dubai. Yeah. Also, they can get recommend. Also, like if your fuel gets low, then an ad will pop up being like, "Hey, consider Shell or what? Consider Taco Bell for your refueling needs." Hmm. Um, and then also sometimes <laughs> legally, we can't tell you that if you squeeze a volcano burrito into the uh, petrol tank, it will continue to run. It'll uh, run faster, if anything. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you're giving your car the shits. <laughs> or your car's like, oh, buddy, I shouldn't have eaten that. In car solution. In car offers you. See, to this pr- is. The, I've played myself here because we were making fun of corporate product placement, and now I've just really made myself want Taco Bell. And probably at least a couple hundred other people. Yeah, genuinely. It's in your mind, Alice. <laughs> oh, Fuck the me. calls are coming from inside the it's, house. It's almost as if I'm constrained by a sort of invisible uh, structure of capitalism. Mm. You know? Last one. Last one. That's why in Dubai we've built this huge structure, but it's completely invisible. <laughs> um, in co- they actually built the superstructure from. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they built the vampire castle. Yeah, the world's first real vampire castle in Dubai. So, uh, in-car offers allow you to promote your business and communicate deals to your customers via their screen. The solutions are displayed to the driver when the car is turned on or after an interaction with a branded pin or search result. You can use them to offer vouchers or discounts that are ex- displayed in the in-car screen. So, yeah, it's like if you click a, an ad once, then it will just pop up you know, again with like, hey, check this out. Well, this has been a horrible experience. Thanks so much. Oh, uh, yeah. That was genuinely one of the Dubai podcasts was about something called the Museum of the Future that they've oh, built in God, Dubai. Yeah. And and he was like and then it was this guy being like, You see, because other cities they're very focused on the past, which is why they have regular museums, but it's why people come to Dubai because we love the future. <laughs> and that's why we've built this museum of the future. And honestly, it's one of the most visited sites in Dubai. The tickets are booked up for the next three months in advance. So if you want to visit the Museum of the Future, please do book. And it's just like, but what can possibly be in there? Uh, like flying car model, you know? Uh, yeah. A bunch of like failed Japanese startups. Toilet. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'd love to go to Dubai uh, to sort of have a horrible time and sort of question mm. the vibe. Uh, but, you know, uh, there are a few reasons why that might be not a great idea for me right now. I want to go there and open up a fish restaurant called oh, exactly. Mahana, I'm Salmon. Exporting the like Glaswegian fish and chip shop to Dubai. Um, I, I think they'd really get a kick out of it. So, Mr. Begbie, please tell me, why are you so passionate about bringing the deep fried Mars bar to Dubai? <laughs> well, I think people in Dubai have always loved experimental fusion cuisine. And so we've taken the traditional uh, tempura batter of Japan and applied it to the British Mars bar. Anyway, anyway, that's four screens. uh, And boy, is four screens for me and probably for you at some point Mm. when you eventually buy a car that was made this year. Every new car sold with an orb. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just a sort of a flat orb, isn't it? You have to you have to like put the orb into the passenger seat in like a baby seat. I got to go to the car moil to get the full screen taken off my BMW. <laughs> so, uh, I'm afraid it's time for another one of the uh, trademark TF jarring shifts in tone. Um, oh boy! Yeah, as we as are we begin the Dubai podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm afraid jarring shift in tone the other way. Uh, oh. As we talk about the um, conclusion to what the press has decided to call Small Boats Week, um, 
and the Tories uh, focus on basically being as cruel to uh, refugees and asylum seekers as possible to please the 5% of people whose um, preferences are actually listened to in British politics because the rest yeah. of what is appropriate to look at has been completely ossified. Yeah, and they've, they've somehow, even on their own extremely favorable terms, managed to fuck it up. Um, and this is why Labour's Ooh. sort of like uh, thing is we're going to deliver all of the same horrors, but managed competently because the Tories are not managing them competently. As we'll have see. you ever wondered what if your horrors were better managed? Mm -hmm. Would you like to consolidate all of your horrors into one easily manageable monthly horror? <laughs> what we're doing is we're failing to imagine the man-made horrors, and as such, they remain resolutely within our comprehension. Small Boats Week is a particularly vulgar expression, yeah, I have I remember, to say. I, that episode of Bake Off was a really sort of like strange experience. <laughs> so I'm going to give a little bit of background here. <laughs> I'm going to give a little bit of background Sorry. here for our non-British listeners, um, which is that the conservative government uh, has decided to, because housing people in like terrible, like flea-bitten bed bug uh, unhygienic hotels at great cost to councils because councils aren't funded to have like dignified welcome centers for refugees, obviously. Um, that had proven to be too expensive and got daily mail readers in extremely high dudgeon. Um, and so, of course, the government's decision you was can't to do that. Their blood pressure is already like fucking compressed gas. Because mm. part of it was genuinely that if you say hotels, uh, your average like newspaper reader in this country imagines some sort of like five-star jacuzzi thing because they've never stayed in a hotel in britain uh yeah if you have stayed in a hotel in britain say for instance if you are a working comedian you are aware mm. that almost universally they are shit yeah it's a it's a plate glass building with a conveyor belt toaster underneath a portrait of henry the eighth for some reason oh, lucky if you get that i mean like uh, yeah. so much of this is just sort of keeping nominally like one and two star hotels that are just like former B and B's in business despite their lingering like mold issues or whatever. Um and like genuinely it's been a case of like stashing people who have escaped, you know, the worst tortures imaginable in uh, you know, like a terrorist house in, you know, Hastings or whatever. It was just like some city, some like some town that just happens to have hotels there because no one is staying in them. And just going, yeah, that's 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 an, a sector of the industry now. Mm. We can just do that. That's hospitality. Yeah. Well, taking people who have escaped the worst tortures imaginable and to add insult to injury, making them stay in a British seaside hotel. <laughs> yeah, genuinely. Well, that I mean, that is true. The point of this is to add insult to injury, right? Yeah, the second worst torture available. <laughs> yeah. But. Right, and this, and that many of these hotels are unsanitary. They are mm. uh, often infested, and even then, like not to provide, sort of, provide yeah. an extremely like obvious target to the far right. Uh, absolutely, fuck with everybody's mental health uh, to the point that, as we had in Glasgow, where like someone who's being like housed in one of these hotels went on a stabbing spree, um, and for the first five minutes afterwards, no one knew whether like that had happened or whether it was like a terrorist attack. No one knew. Um, it, it it's like absolutely dismal uh and you know it one thing that the government and the media are right about is that this is intolerable but not for the reasons mm. they imagine they believe it's intolerable because you we're spending too much money because you know um bob and jane hotelier in hastings have realized oh that I'm going to be booked completely full from the government forever which is not price sensitive so i can say all of these rooms are 400 pounds a night Mm -hmm. And that okay, fine. We have to do it uh, because the in local the great yeah. British business system that we know and love. Yeah. Well, indeed, kind of. Uh, and so, anyway, in order to respond to that, uh, the government has commissioned a barge uh, that used to have like um, offshore oil workers or has, has housed various different people before. Usually, people who are working at, working somewhere, and so are there for like an evening. Um, yeah, like oil rig workers yeah, oil and rig stuff. Work. Who, like, are not famed for their quality of life, but also, you know, uh, work for, you know... They get paid a lot. They get paid, like, £700 trillion an hour to work for, like, a month on the rigs and then come back and, like, you know, buy a house in Aberdeen. Like, it, it's it's not the same. It's not even remotely comparable. So, uh, and anyway, this, this barge has been then sort of has been uh, procured and stored in Dorset, and the idea is 
Um, instead of renting out all of these one star hotels up and down the country, uh, the government is just going to sort of performatively have this basically prison ship that every single right wing columnist has agreed is like the icon of the seas, but of course, redone British. Um, now, the reason that this is in this is in the news for a number of reasons. Number one, because of obviously the sheer inhumanity of it. Uh, and I think it's like it's designed to be a policy that's sheerly inhuman because it's supposed to delight Lee Anderson specifically, right? That it's for him specifically. Yeah, because you can't get your your Rwanda flights still because of the lefty lawyers, and so you have to do some some red meat stuff. And so this is the red meat is uh, prison Hulk. Lee Anderson, who, and I talk about this in my show every day, once said, my grandfather fought the Nazis and he would be proud to turn back the migrant boats today. So it's good to know that it's a man doing this with a firm grasp on history and why we did certain things. Mm -hmm. So um, the Telegraph, and so basically now the timeline of this has been a timeline of the commissioning and then um, loading of the first sort of groups of people onto this boat has established that in fact like there was a legionella infection on the boat um at the time that people were put onto it um oh so they're too good for the royal british legion now are they <laughs> um want to come to this country don't even want to get legionnaires disease like the troops yeah, so it, it, like bacteria wearing a tinier poppy it was it confirmed <laughs> basically that the and everyone at that point said, "Oh, it's the duty of the barge contractors to operate the barge safely." No, it's the duty of the local authority to inspect the barge. No, actually, it's the duty of the home office to ensure the barge is safe. And as per usual, the political questions aren't why do we have the fucking barge. It's when did minute? It, oh, did Suella Braverman get this email on Monday or Tuesday? It's it's mm. basically just like. An, an outlook audit as opposed to a question, substantive question of why we have the barge, because fundamentally, when questioned about it, Labour said, well, yeah, we'd have to keep the barge, I suppose. I mean, we have this barge, so what are we going to do, not use it? Yeah, but we would do it better. In all of all of the stuff that the Tories have done, uh, but, you know, in a sl with a slightly nicer gloss on it. We could, we've already bought the barge, so it would be unsensible and unserious not to use the barge in some way. Perhaps we could repurpose it as a Pontins holiday camp, <laughs> where people in Britain who hate fun and enjoying themselves could go and have a very grey time where they eat things such as beans on toast for four meals a day. So, and I, we talk about like the, the political questions being asked are who got what email when um, to prove sort of gotchas. And ultimately, the game of finger pointing where everyone can say they lived up to their responsibilities, but despite the fact that everyone lived up to their responsibilities, people still were moved onto an unsafe barge indicates that everyone's responsibility involves putting people on an unsafe fucking barge, right? That's the implication there. You can sort of like, <sighs> there is a sort of like a quotidian use to this in the sense that like, in much the same way as the Rwanda deportations, where it's like, in order to stop this from being enacted in order to stop it from going on you have to do this kind of like very annoying uh missing the point where actually you haven't checked all of the boxes on this form where you want to do the like brutal thing thing uh as a means to an end sure that's fine as a sort of like locus of public discourse no one has been saying oh you know this is uh, a national disgrace right which it is um, it feels a bit like concentration camp commandant at the Nuremberg trials being asked about stuff and going, no, I was technically catering. You would have to ask the health and safety guy about that. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I have a sort of a theory about this, about the over, uh, like overarching politics of this. And indeed, you know, Rwanda and, uh, you know, pushbacks in the channel, all of this, which is, yeah, we've seen this time and time again that, uh, you know, uh, the right and, you know, the center right that passes for the left that's in politics in this country loves to concede further rightwards. And it really is just like, there are, you know, I don't want to put a number on it, like a small percentage of people in this country who fully just want the camps, who just want death camps and will not be satisfied with anything less. And every single time, every single like, uh, installment towards that has been them saying this isn't enough we demand more and everyone else falling over themselves to go uh, yes you're absolutely right we have to be we have to be serious and crack down on this it's like <sighs> did 
There was this little browser game years and years ago called QWOP. Q-W-O-P. I don't know if you if, if you remember this. Oh, I remember um, QWOP. I wasted a lot of time in a lot of classes playing QWOP. Yeah. So you, you had sort of like each limb was mapped to a key and it, it, you had to move a guy down a like a, an athletics track and he moved very like ungainly in a kind of very funny way, right? That's kind oh, of... Okay. That's kind of been the process. Is uh, on the road to fascism, we have been quopping down it to, by like individually, every single like limb of this has been like, yeah, sure, let's do this. Let's uh, you know, and do some more deportations. Let's do the Rwanda plan. Let's do pushbacks in the Channel. Let's do uh, this barge now. Um, and I tr- really and truly worry for you know uh, where this is going to take us. You know, as if where it's taking us now isn't bad enough. And it's the when we talk about where the movement in politics is, it's right? A tortured well, metaphor yeah. that required use of a like browser game no one remembers. Um, I remember Quop. Uh, it, it, it's a look, tortured. We browser. here in Britain, we don't believe that metaphors deserve to be tortured. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that's that's apt, right? Because one of the things we've noted on this podcast before is that the political energy in this country that is permitted to exist is the political energy on the right. And the disagreement Mm -hmm. between sort of the center right and the right is how quickly do we rush towards it? And what emotion do we display display whilst we do that? Are we walking towards it sadly or running towards it gleefully? Mm. And here was just kind of like, tripping towards it you know we're just kind of like stumbling britain is like a surveillance video of a guy on ketamine who's forgotten how to walk i'm playing crop but i'm doing it and shaking my head so that people know i'm doing it solemnly and only because it is the sensible and grown-up thing to do not because i'm enjoying it i've never actually enjoyed anything just ask my wife so if um if we look, I, I pulled a few quotes about this, right? There's the Lee Anderson one where he says, anyone that's complaining about the standard of this luxury accommodation, which again, I want to be clear, right? From someone who lived on it, who wrote about it in The National in Scotland, said, look, the rooms I stayed in were like a cabin on a ferry. There was a small single bed. And if you were sharing a room, it would have been with someone doing the opposite shift. The rooms were small and clearly designed for sleeping in, not living in. These are, these are people being forced to live in rooms that aren't designed to be lived in. Where, yeah, oh yeah, it has all these wonderful facilities that, again, like the um, Lionel Shriver took pains to point out in her uh, Spectator article, but where other people are saying, oh, well, actually, you're very restricted. You can't really go to the, the lounge. You, you, you can't really go to the dining hall. If you want, you're very restricted as to when you can leave. And even if you can leave, you can't work and can't get any money. So what the fuck are you going to do? Right, you're just being a center polish during the Queen's funeral. Yeah, and you just have to you just have to sit in a twelve by twelve room waiting for an indefinite amount of time, essentially just um in in a prison, effectively in prison. A prison where you're technically allowed to walk out, but where then the society you get into has been designed as a prison to keep you out of participating in any of it. So mm-hmm. the idea that this is luxurious is you know, frankly insulting, but is designed to keep this same 5% of people who are the f- laser focus of everybody in the political mainstream in this country engaged and more importantly incensed so that they'll demand further movement, that the ship must be worse. Maybe the ship should be the ship should sink periodically. I don't know. But it's the ship of Theseus, but you can only take bits off of the ship and you're not allowed to put anything back to replace them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mostly I just feel like anyone who believes that, you know, any any sort of like uh, asylum seeker is living in luxury presumably lives in this country, presumably is aware of, you know, uh, the things that happen here. I would struggle to believe that almost anyone just on the numbers lives in luxury in this fucking country. Like, d- uh, how much luxury do we have going around that you think the government is just dispensing? Well, again, it's it's crabs in a bucket, right? Like the Tory party trades on, like, look how shit your life is. Mm. And, 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 and these asylum seekers aren't even being murdered. Look at that. Like, I mean, I think basically, right, there are three positions you can have on this, right? You've got loony, loony unrealistic lefties like us who think that perhaps putting asylum seekers on a prison ship isn't the way forward. And then you've got the Labour Party who think that, um, you know, the, 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 the asylum seeker should be put on a prison barge, but in a regulated way. And then you've got like the 5% of people who are in charge who think that we should put them on a, on a prison ship and then sink it. Like those are the, those are the three opinions that you can have. Mm. 
and, and this is what Starmer says, right? Well, not Starmer, but this is Stephen Kinnock, who's the shadow uh, immigration, said, we'll be left with no choice but to deal with the mess that we inherit, suggesting they wouldn't decommission the barges and wouldn't give a timeline on when they would. And then James O'Brien saying, look, we have to remember that Starmer is trying to get elected in a country where people are regularly posting laughing emojis on stories of drowned refugees without, of course, himself investigating the role of his radio station and why people might be fucking doing that. Mm. You know, it's- yeah, and and also, like, since when are we letting those people decide things? Since when should we? And, like, fucking, that's not that many people. If you'd, like, actively poll people on this, it's... <sighs> most people are not like this. Um, and it's it's just absolutely a case of the tail wagging the dog in terms of this kind of extremism. Well, I mean, I say this in my show, if you take the average person in this country and assuming that they haven't had, you know, the Daily Mail injected directly into their brainstem and you ask them the question, what do you think about asylum seekers in the channel? I don't think their response would be, oh, I do hope we're drowning them. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's you only that's an insane thing to think. Yeah. And and the, the other thing is. Everyone knows that that's an insane thing to think. Everyone in every form of media, in every political organization, uh, I, you know, the Conservative Party. I'm not saying that they have a, a like a secret better nature. Quite the opposite. I'm saying that they know this is insane. Almost all of them know better than to like believe any of it. But you know, it, it suits them to maintain power this way by just conceding and conceding and conceding. Um, I don't know if that's worse, but it's certainly awful in a different way. Mm -hmm. And a thing which I don't say in the show because it would complicate the logic too much is that in a way that Lee Anderson can't possibly understand, he is sort of onto something when he says, my grandfather fought the Nazis and would be proud to turn back the migrant boats today. Because, mm -hmm. you know, despite what a lot of people who read the Daily Mail think, during World War II, our attitude to Jewish refugees from Europe who were fleeing literal death was much the same. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the fact that there is so much agreement on stuff like this is why it always really irks me when there are like polls done by newspapers asking which leader of a party would you rather go to dinner with because that's all that's left between them it's the, look the we're gonna have the barge there's no not having the barge be yeah, realistic but the question is which prime minister who is currently overseeing the barge would you hit a savory vape with yeah, which which current candidate for Prime Minister of the UK would you rather be imprisoned on a prison barge with? Now, I'm feeling like Rishi Sunak would maybe be better at helping you manage your asset portfolio, but Keir Starmer may be more fun to have a real ale with. I, I would say to to like live on the barge with Rishi Sunak, both quieter, keeps to himself more, also takes up less space. So it, it's got to be like a true. rational rational decision you could make up rishi sunak a little bed inside your suitcase <laughs> like a like a foundling um yeah I, I love that terry pratchett story about the uh, rishi sunak who lives in the department store um well, guys i'm so, i can't get out of this suitcase i mean thank you for the cozy bed but it's very hard to climb over the side i can barely see i can't reach the porthole <laughs> Please. Just, I, 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 it, it's all wrong. It's all backwards. T take this out of, you know, Devon, put it up the Thames, moor it next to the Houses of Parliament, and make MPs live on it. Like, it, it, you, you do not need an expenses paid London flat if you live on the river adjacent to your work. And apparently, it's perfectly adequate. Get in the barge. Yeah. yeah. Somehow, it's 1500 PCM for a room on that. <laughs> yeah. Looking forward to my new career as barge landlord. Mm. <laughs> well, just go, going around, like having your rattling your truncheon on the MPs' cages. Yeah, well, no, sort of like I, I'm in the bathroom. I'm like pointing at a, at a patch of sort of like green mold, and I'm like, "That's not Legionella." Yeah, well, yeah. Stop ringing me up about the Legionella on the barge. Look, it's because you're drying your clothes in your room. So, <laughs> by the way, painting over the Legionella. <laughs> those polls I, I mentioned, uh, those are real polls. Uh, with 33% of people saying, surveyed for the mail, said they'd rather go out on the town with Keir Starmer, only 25 would go out with Rishi Sunak. Uh, oh, damn. Well, yeah, who would you rather have a Jaeger bomb at all bar one with? When you say go out with, are we saying that Keir Starmer is, like, more fuckable? <laughs> Hit the town, yeah, I yeah. think. Surveyed by yeah. the mail? What, are you gay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're people, you're just you just going, just like, are we? Have we just built a floating concentration camp? They're like, yeah, forget about that. Would you have a Toby Carvery with Keir Starmer? <laughs> Which, right? Would he? Would he go for the gravy first or the cauliflower cheese? 
<laughs> Look, this is important. Like, would he take a big Yorkshire and put all of the roast inside it, or would he have a couple of small Yorkshires on the side? <laughs> all right. I, I, I think I can't have the big Yorkshire. I'd become trapped inside it. I'd drown in the gravy. <laughs> it's becoming more Richard Iwardi the more I do it, but I enjoy that. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, anyway, I, I, I think that's probably a, as good a place as any to leave it for today. Hmm. This is a criminal political establishment. It's I just... can't reach the buffet. I left my little step at home. <laughs> it's a criminal political establishment, but some of the voices... And we're taking them all to Toby mm. Carvery. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we're well, putting yeah. all of Parliament in a big minibus and we're taking them to Toby Carvery as a treat. Help! I'm trapped in the custard. <laughs> we wanted to take them somewhere else, but our car, ma- a navigation system, keeps going back to Toby Carvery. <laughs> it's only only Toby Carvery has taken them up on the sponsorship deal. Oh fuck! We should have done that instead of Taco Bell. I'm, fuck! I'm so stupid. Anyway, anyway, mm. um, Toby I Bell. think that's about it for today. Uh, thank you for listening to this free episode. If you want to listen to more episodes of the podcast, of course, there is a bonus episode. Uh, it's five dollars a month on Patreon, and there's also ten dollar episodes if you want extra Britonologies or Left on Reds. Alice and I are going to record Left on Red this weekend. Um, that's right. Mm. We are. Help! Yeah. Help! I'm drowning in content. I got into the Trash Future Patreon, but I can't climb back out. Uh, I'm legitimately still quite angry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't have the like big relaxation vein moments really. It just kind of like simmers. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I'm I'm just gonna have to go and like take a walk or something, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well um mm. and uh So we're wishing you, the listeners, a very happy, nice little walk. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Go have a walk. Give a friend a big hug. Uh walk down to the Toby Carver <laughs> and meet Keir Starmer. <laughs> um and hey, you coin. know what? It's if you're listening to this in the day it comes out, it is Tuesday, the 22nd of August. There are still a few days left of Milo. Mm. Second five-star review today, cunts. Get down there. We, we, got, we got two award nominations. It's all happening. And I will answer the question, should you have a Toby Carvery with Keir Starmer? Yeah. <laughs> if you're in Milo's audience, shout out during the show, preferably during the emotional climax, would you have a Toby yeah. Carvery with Keir Starmer? He'll appreciate it. He'll become your real life friend afterwards. Mm. I've, I've never had an emotional climax. I always climax in the appropriate way without letting emotions cloud my judgment. <laughs> I say to my wife, Great work. That was classic intercourse. <laughs> Awful. Um, all right. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you on the bonus episode or see you on the free episode. Bye-bye. Mm. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>